Hello, everyone. Um, happy Wednesday, veterans, and thank you for spending time um, with us today. Uh, so before we get started on today's topics, if you can sound off in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from, what branch of service, uh, what branch and what years you served. Yeah, welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, glad to have you all here. Glad to be here. Uh, if it's your first time joining us, uh, welcome home. For about the next five minutes or so, we're going to kick off with our, our introductions, you know, uh, tell you a little bit about ourselves and who you're talking to. So, Nat, you want to go ahead and go up with that? Oh, well, there's Marcos here. Hi, Marcos. Welcome, U.S. Army. Fredell. New Orleans, welcome. Army. We've got some Army folks in here. U.S. Air Force, Caesar. Hey, Jim. How's it going? Army Vietnam veteran. Welcome, welcome. From Virginia Beach. Those used to be my stomping grounds when I was around the Navy. <laughs> hey, Albert, I'm here at Austin, too. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Ricky. Yeah, one, of my, one of my veterans are here, too. How you doing, William? Glad to have you. Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, Beverly. We love Beverly. Welcome, welcome. Got some Marine Corps. Welcome, Derek Smith. Welcome, Daniel Rodriguez, San Diego, California, United States Marine Corps. Thank you for your service. Welcome, Bob Isabel, Army, 1st Infantry Division. I was over there in Germany when I was with 1st ID, so welcome. Jordan Martinez, U.S. Army. Clark Davis, United States Coast Guard. Lee Hanna, United States Air Force. Wayne Robinson, Navy. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Uh, we got a lot of different, different ranges. Different branches in here. Well, I think that's the first Navy I see. Wayne Robinson, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a few more, but the one you saw. Oh, Kevin here too, U.S. Navy. One of my vets. Hey, Victor. Anthony Pelly, Army. Welcome, welcome. Ray Johnson, Army as well. Chris Giles, Army as well. Fort Carson, I, sta I was stationed there from 05 to 2012. Kevin Knowles, U.S. Navy. Kitty Hawk. Yeah, I saw that one, too. Good morning, Derek. Derek Bond, U.S. Navy. Army Air Force. Mike Hollett. Welcome, welcome. Another, unit, another Air Force Vietnam War vet. Welcome, Ken. Welcome, David. Clevenger, Navy Fleet Marine Force. Michael Martin, Desert Storm Vet Army. Welcome. I see that. Carla, Army. Welcome. Hi, David. We just spoke. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that works. Sometimes you'll be on the call with somebody before, and then right here they, they show up with on the live, too. So... Yeah, welcome, guys. Glad to have you all here. Dan Hillard. Welcome, welcome. All right, so we are five after. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this information with us. Um, welcome home. All right, so we're going to get started with just a, some quick introductions about who we are. Um, my name is Coach Natalie Jones. Um, I did serve in the Navy. I did for four years from 2012 to 2016, Camo. Um, and I was an elite member here at VA Claims Insider. I actually worked my way up for seven years after getting out of the service um, to 90%. And then I was struggling, like uh, a lot of you likely are, um, to get that last. I think I only needed like 3% more to get to 95, rounded to 100. And so um, I kind of signed up to be a member here first before actually starting to work here. And 
uh, through the efforts of my peers, we were able to get me to 100% on November 2nd in 2020, was that 2021? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Um, and so what brought me to working here as a coach? Um, so I have always worked with veterans since I got out of the military. It's just kind of a passion of mine. And um, honestly, I had a friend that sent me the link um, to this company. And when I saw that I wasn't getting um, chosen right away, I decided that I was going to sign up um, and become an elite member. And then really just kind of push my way into the company. Um, I was very passionate about what I wanted to do here and um, it just worked out for the best. And so here I am uh, really, really passionate about helping veterans and figuring out best ways to find solutions to whatever it is that you all are struggling with. Yeah. Thanks coach. Natalie, that's a little bit different than mine. Um, I served from 2005 to 2015. I got medically retired. I served uh, in multiple different locations. Uh, like I told one of the other veterans on here, I was stationed at Carson. Uh, was actually from 2009 to 2012, uh, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, had some stuff that happened that was mental health related and uh, got medically retired with 90% uh, and retired as a staff sergeant. Um, so I was enlisted. So not like Natalie, I was enlisted. Um, and... The, the, the road to get to 100% was, was interesting. Um, I didn't trust the process right away. Um, didn't know if it was going to be the right fit, uh, but ended up being the right fit. Trust my coach, trust the process, trust everything that he was telling me that was, you know, the right route and uh, got to 100% permanent total on November 2nd, just like Natalie. Um, we got the same day. Uh, we were announcing it and she announced it at the same time. And I was like, whoa, this just happened. And our president's like, well, that's weird. And uh, it was just a cool experience. And now we're, we're 100%. Uh, we call ourselves twins. We call ourselves brother and sister. Uh, there's a lot of different things. Um, and what brought me to being a VACI veteran coach? Well, I did a different route. I was actually one of the intake people. I started out as a BDR. And when I saw the opportunity to become a veteran coach, I jumped right on it. Um, my, my passion to help veterans extended past um, just getting you guys on board, but I really wanted to be a part of that process too, mm -hmm. to help you guys get you what you deserve morally, medically, and legally. So glad to have you here. Glad to be a part of this organization and a part of your process and a part of your journey. Absolutely. And really just to be a part of something that is just mission and impact driven, um, you know, what you guys feel and go through, we've likely gone through, you know, as well. And we really empathize, you know, so we we're definitely here to try and, you know, get you where you want to go. Um, you serve, you deserve. Um, so before we get started into the topic, we're going to go over a few other things. Um, so just to start off with the disclaimer. Um, so we are not accredited agents, VSOs, attorneys, or any other entity recognized by the Department of Veterans Affairs, and we are not affiliated with the VA in any way. Uh, VA Claims Insider is an education-based coaching consulting company for disabled veterans exploring eligibility for increased VA disability benefits and who wish to learn more about that process. VA Claims Insider also connects veterans with vetted independent medical professionals in our referral network for medical examinations and independent medical opinions, also known as IMOs. Uh, you guys will hear that a lot um, for a wide range of disability conditions. All right. So a big part of this process uh, is what we call our SEM method, you know, the strategy. That's the part you build up with your coach um, and figuring out what's the best possible route, what's the least path of resistance. Uh, education side of this is really all the resources that are across uh, all spectrums from the resources that your coach uh, gives you in your insider portal if you're an elite member to uh, the, the VACI, um, VACLaimsInsider.com website where you can literally search for just about anything on there um, and a really good one-on-one -on -one with, with your coach with all this stuff. This collectively uh, along with medical evidence. You know, Coach Natalie just alleviated to that, too, as well, as far as uh, going to our sister company that we have a partnership with, 
that uh, provides us with medical evidence, uh, possibly an IMO, maybe a nexus letter, or maybe a DBQ. It just depends what your route is, what your path is, as far as that with your coach. Uh, you do get a one-on-one coaching with, with this process. Um, so it's not uh, just your coach, though. Also, we're a team effort. You know, our, our AAs are an intricate part of this, too. So they help us out tremendously as far as this process goes, too. Um, Get on board and get 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 started. Uh, if you're already in this process, get that strategy going. That's that strategy session of what we establish and figure out what's the best game plan. Um, so that's that's the the basis of you know working on with your, with your coach is they figure out what that game plan is, what the least path of resistance is to get you most out of the process too. Uh, claim submission. You are going to be submitting your claims on your own, uh, provided with your coach. You will have that coaching is that coaching uh, ability with it, with coaching consulting that we can provide uh, to be able to um, help you with that process. Um, CMP preparation, we have classes, both mental and medical preparation classes that you can attend. Um, as long as you're an elite member, you can, you can attend those classes um, and uh, they'll provide you with some information and some very valuable what I call knowledge nuggets that get dropped in there on a variety of different classes. Um, I always mention to my, my veterans, you know, go ahead and attend multiple classes. It, it really it benefits you more. And then we can follow up with any other questions you may have with an additional CMP exam prep class. Um, we have three times a day. We have live classes, uh, mostly for, uh, and we also have coffee with coaches every day from Monday through Friday. Uh, Mental health Mondays, uh, which we used to call Mental Health Mondays, is now Mondays and Thursdays. So it's Monday at 7 p.m. Central and Thursdays at 12 p.m. Central. Uh, medical Prep is Monday at 12 Central and Tuesday at uh, 7 p.m. Central. So new client orientation is every Tuesday and Thursday as well. So those are just some of the classes. Um, there's also Women Wednesdays and a couple other classes that fall into there as well, along with this Facebook Live that we do uh, every Wednesday too as well. Um, Check out Brian's new edition of You Serve It. It's now now uh, on Amazon. Um, I should be getting my copy pretty soon because I ordered it as well. Uh, it was a very big wealth of knowledge, new stuff coming out that you guys should check out too. Um, we've been talking about Pack Deck for a long time and it goes into some of that detail too. So check out those things. Um, and if you want to get on board and you're not part of the process, go ahead and get that discovery call booked. It's a free call. You can get on with our one of our uh, elite uh, members here that can provide you some information to get you on board. Uh, so if you want to learn more, schedule a free discovery call and talk to one of our team members uh, by, go by going to vaclaims.help. Uh, if you need help, reach out to the organization uh, at vaclaimsinsider.com. We'd love to partner with you on your VA claim journey. All right, Natalie, you want to go ahead and discuss our next topic? Yeah, so our actual topic for today, because I'm not sure if we actually spoke on it just yet, but we're actually talking about high value secondary conditions. Um, and those are going to include headaches slash migraines, um, GERD, as well as IBS. And so um, with the with any condition, right, let's start off with the basics. How are, do you establish service connection secondary to any service connection connected condition? All right. So in accordance with the 38 CFR, um, disabilities that are approximately due to or aggravated by service connected disease or injury, um, a current disability condition, which is approximately due to the result of a service connected disease or injury shall be service connected. So basically, if you already have a condition that exists, um, if there is another condition that uh this, uh, the primary condition has aggravated um, this new condition, then it's something that can potentially be connected. All right, so service connection on a secondary basis requires a showing of causation. What is the cause? Um, which in a lot of cases, it's that primary condition. Um, and the showing of causation requires that the secondary disability uh, claim be known to be approximately due to or aggravated by another service connected disability. Um, so really, we're going to break that down a little bit further. There are three evidentiary elements that must be satisfied to service connect secondary conditions to, um, to anything else, right? 
So um, this is what we call the Calusa Triangle. Um, and so uh, the first thing is medical diagnosis of a non-service um, uh, connected disability. So a medical diagnosis of the secondary disability condition you're attempting to link to another service connected condition. So that's going to be the first thing that you need to make sure that you have. Um, and we're going to obviously break this down a little bit further for like migraines, the GERD and the IBS. Um, uh, the second thing that they're looking for is a current service connected di uh, primary disability. So, um, you know, your VA, whatever your VA rating is. And the last thing is a medical nexus. So you do have to have a current diagnosis um, for the second piece. And then the last thing is a nexus. Sometimes a nexus is already kind of built in. Um, and other times you may need to, uh, you know, build some of that evidence in which we can do and will do, uh, will be able to help you with by partnering with Telemedica and being able to send you over to that route. All right. Thanks, Natalie. And we're going to talk a little bit about migraine headaches. You know, migraine attacks can last for hours to days. Uh, pain can be as severe and that interferes with your daily activities. It might even cause you to have to lay down what's known as a prostrating migraine. So maybe you have to get into a dark room. You have to get into away from all the noise um, that could be known as prostrating. Of course, we're not going to explain that uh, whenever we're in a CMP exam, we're not going to describe things as prostrating. You're explaining it as uh, it, it hurts really bad, and I've got to get in a dark room and in, a, in a, a quiet space. Um, the VA rates migraines and headaches, tension headaches, cluster headaches, whatever you can call them, uh, under CFR 38 Parts 4, Scheduling for Rating Disabilities, uh, Diagnostic Code or DC Code uh, 8100 uh, for migraines. Uh, VA ratings for migraines ranges from 0 to 50% with the interim breaks of 10% and 30%. So it depends on the severity of symptoms. Like again, we're talking about prostrating headaches um, and we'll talk about um, you know, severity, how bad does it feel? How long does it last? And how many times does it happen? And the VA rates it based off of those severity of symptoms. Um, the maximum rating for migraine headaches is 50%, which has symptoms such as very frequent, complete prostrating, you must lay down prolonged attacks productive by severe economic in inadaptability. Your headaches affect your work and ability to produce. So maybe um, <clears throat> you're at work and you're, you're going along your day and you start getting headaches and maybe it's affecting these things. You're, you're having these things affecting your, your cognitive ability or your, your ability to concentrate in those things too. So how it affects your ability to produce or productivity. Um, over 837,217 uh, disabled veterans have been have a disability rating for migraines. So it's it's a lot of people that have been diagnosed with these conditions and have a rating for this condition. Um, I myself are at 30%. I didn't quite reach the 50%, but I still take medication and I still get prostrating headaches that can put me out of work and has put me out of work, out of work in the past. Um, and just a tip here, perhaps the single most important word that you can make or break your VA rating for migraines is the word prostrating. The reason is so important is because the 30% and 50% VA ratings criteria contain the word prostrating in reference to both frequency and severity of your headaches. The best definition we could find for prostrating, prostrating comes from the, the dictionary.com uh, to lay oneself flat on the ground face downward, especially in reverence of or submission. Uh, prostrating is further defined as weakness, fatigue, distress, exhaustion, or illness, for example, to reduce someone to extreme physical weakness. So this is pretty bad. This is when it's pretty debilitating. Um, it's the point where it's, it's, it may cause some other symptoms. Uh, some of it have described it as having causing nausea, dizziness, and a lot of other symptoms that can cause this too. So PTSD can cause migraines, especially in the U.S. military veterans who suffer from severe symptoms of PTSD. Uh, one study we found at 30%, 32% of OEF, OIF veterans with PTSD say that they have problems with headaches. <clears throat> A growing body of epidemiological literature supports an association between migraines and PTSD. Uh, PTSD prevalence rate, rates have been demonstrated to be increasing in those in migraines in multiple different cohorts, including territorial pain and headache clinics, uh, 
veteran cohorts and general population surveys. In the territorial clinics, uh, base studies approximately 22 to 30% of the headache sufferers fulfill PTSD criteria. Uh, in an, a veteran cohort survey, the prevalence of PTSD was even greater than found than territorial clinics, with most 50% of those migraines fulfilling criteria for PTSD. Thus, migraine headaches are one of the most common secondary conditions of PTSD to PTSD. Uh, there is some medical ideology to suggest that migraines and many different types of headaches can proximately due to or aggravated by PTSD. And finally, migraines are commonly side effects of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs. Uh, and some of them, such as you may be taking some of these uh, Sotopram or Celexa, Ixyl Sotopram or Lexapro, Fluoroxite, which is Prozac, uh, Parazine, if I'm not pronouncing these correct, I, per, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I'm, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to probably call them what, what they are. So Celexa, Lexapro, Prozac, Paxlor, Pexiva, and, and uh, uh, Zoloft. So it's, it, those are the pretty common ones that we see that are used as SSRIs for, for mental health. All right, I'm going to kick it over to Coach Natalie. We're going to talk a little bit about GERD. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, GERD is also very common in veterans um, and is actually the 23rd out of 50th uh, many, uh, sorry, of most claimed VA disabilities. So we do have a list of the most claimed disabilities and it's 50 of those, but GERD is number 23 on that. And so GERD stands for gastro, <laughs> I hate this word, gastro, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I mean, it occurs when stomach acid frequently flows back into the tube connecting your mouth and stomach, uh, leading to painful acid reflux. Um, so the VA rates GERD as a digestive disability um, by analogy uh, to the hiatal hernia. So it just basically means that it is rated under hiatal hernia if you were to look into the 38 CFR. Um, and that code there is, uh, it's a uh, code uh, 7346. Um, and it's normally, like I said, rated um, due to the, sorry, is normally used to rate GERD due to the similarity of those symptoms under the hiatal hernia. All right. So VA ratings for GERD are either 10, 30, or 60%. All right. And so what are the, what's the breakdown of that? Um, so for a 60% rating, um, it includes uh, pain, vomiting, material weight loss, uh, and hematemesis, uh, which basically means vomiting blood, um, or melina, which is blood in the stool, um, with moderate anemia or other symptom combinations uh, productive of severe impairment of health of a health rate. Um, and that again, that is at that 60%. Um, at 30%, um, GERD is with persistently recurring epigastric distress with dysphagia, pyrosis, and regurgitation. So again, that vomiting, um, that painful uh, substernal pain that you might have in your chest, um, regurgitation, um, all of that. Um, and so that is accompanied by, um, like I said, substernal or arm or shoulder pain. Um, and that is where you would get that 30%. Um, if, if any of you suffer from GERD uh, and you're maybe underrated, you're maybe at 0% or 10%, um, if you have that pain in your chest and it's moving over to your shoulder, gas moves, okay? Uh, I was telling Ian this earlier today, quick little hilarious story about how um, I ended up going to the doctor's not knowing that gas moved in different areas. And so uh, it was really embarrassing moment. And so um, to find out that it was sitting way deep in my back, <laughs> And I was there for nothing, thinking I was dying, you know, from issues with my kidney. But um, these are some of the symptoms of having that acid reflux and that GERD, uh, basically that gas moving around. And so um, if it's moved over to your shoulder, that's a clear indication to go speak with your doctors maybe and uh, see, you know, if they can, you know, further put in your notes where that pain has moved to. Um, but again, that's at that 30%. Um, and GERD with two or more of those symptoms at the 30% is, uh, but it's less severe, is at the 10% rating. And so really, um, you know, we talked about the Calusa triangle, you know, having that primary condition, having the diagnosis and having the nexus. Um, 
the the other piece that you know we're missing there and Ian alluded to it earlier is you know the severity frequency and duration of your symptoms um, for any condition you can get rated you can you know work to get rated uh, and they can put you at a zero percent rating however um, what gets you at those higher ratings is really speaking to that severity. How bad is it? How often does it happen? And, you know, how long does it last? Severity, frequency, and duration. So that's going to be another key piece there um, that you'd want to share, you know, with your doctors. Um, and, you know, if we need to send you over to Telemedica, um, you know, to get a nexus or something, you'd want to share it with them as well. All right. And another pro tip, uh, many veterans with GERD or acid reflux, uh, especially those who were diagnosed long after leaving the military are eligible under the law for GERD secondary to PTSD. Um, for example, if veterans are taking SSRIs, um, which we were kind of also talking about some of these, um, some of these were listed actually under the the migraines as well. But uh, if you're taking SSRIs for mental health or PTSD, um, you may be suffering from some of the side effects. And so some of the SSRIs are Celexa, Lexapro, Prozac, Paxil, Pixiva, and Zoloft. Um, and, you know, if you have any of these symptoms, then it's, it's, you know, cause to kind of bring up with your doctors and make sure that you're building some of that evidence um, so nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, headaches, uh, drowsiness, dry mouth, insomnia, uh, nervousness, agitation or restlessness, uh, dizziness, um, sex ugh, sexual problems and uh, impact on appetite. Um, and then also, and I think I saw a question about this earlier or a statement, but also it can lead to digestive syst uh, system issues um, by taking those medications. And so uh, the the veteran can get a GERD VA rating secondary to PTSD. So um, if you have been taking a number of these uh, medications and it started to affect you, uh, that you were required to take due to another condition you're service connected for, um, it's definitely possible to get service connected as secondary. I do think it's also important to share that for secondary conditions, um, again, if it's been a long time since you've been out of service, uh, you are likely going to need some extra help in getting that nexus, all right? So um, to make sure that it comes from a doctor that it can be and should be connected to another condition. All right, so that's just for everyone to keep in mind. And then Ian, throwing it back over to you for the IBS. All right, <clears throat> IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. Um, medical research points to connect between IBS and depression, both psychological and physiological variables appear to play important roles in development and maintenance of IBS. So both psychological and physical, like the, the physical response uh, of the, of the, the condition is what we're, we're speaking about. And recent information suggests that the association of IBS and psychiatric disorders may be more fundam fundamental than was previously uh, believed and significant amount of clinical and research data suggests the importance of brain uh, gut interaction in, in IBS. <clears throat> in a study published by National Library of Medicine, they examined the observed high prevalence of psychiatric disorders in patients with IBS. The published literature indicates that, that fewer than half of individuals, individuals with IBS seek treatment for each of those who do 50% to 90% have psychiatric disorders, including panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and social phobia, post-traumatic stress disorder, and major depression, while those who do not seek treatment tend to be psychologically normal. Um, so what is the rating for IBS secondary to depression? VA ratings for IBS to secondary depression uh, <clears throat> is either either, I'm sorry, are either 0, 10, or 30. So it's, it's going to be one of these ratings. This system issue and is most common underrated. Sorry about that. You okay there? Is most commonly rated as a CFR 38 parts four VA schedule of ratings diagnostic code 79 or 7319 irritable colon syndrome. So IBS secondary to depression rating scale. 
<clears throat> severe diarrhea or alternating diarrhea and constipation with more or less constant abdominal distress. So either you have either the, the, the uh, constant of, uh, needing to go or you're not able to go um, more than less than constant. And that's about the 30% rating. Uh, moderate frequent episodes of bowel disturbances with uh, abdominal distress. So maybe you have some issues with uh, some stomach pains and some distress in there where it's not able to get, get taken care of. So it's, it's around the 10%. And then IBS mild disturbances of bowel function with occasional episodes of abdominal distress uh, it will be a zero rating uh, where it's, it's not as often. All right. Well, that's that, well, all we have for IBS and GERD. Um, we're going to start for our Q and A session. We'll look at some of the questions in the chat and get some of those answered for you guys. So thanks for bearing with us. Yeah, and I do want to actually add, um, we've been <laughs> speaking about these three conditions, um, as they're related to mental health and depression, they can also be, uh, secondary to other conditions as well. Um, so like for the migraines, it can be secondary to, uh, you know, uh, sleep apnea, it can be secondary to tinnitus, um, and the mental health, uh, GERD can be secondary to just about, I see a lot of them. So, uh, mental health, uh, can be secondary to, um, any physical condition that you have where you're taking a large sum of medication, uh, especially over a course of years. Um, and it can also be secondary to respiratory conditions as well. Uh, and same for IBS. So there's a number of, um, there's a number of things that if you guys are, do have some further questions about what other conditions outside of mental health that these can be connected to, I would, you know, sign up with us and, uh, you know, get on a discovery call and, you know, someone will be able to chat with you and talk with you about that. All right. And now we'll just open it up for questions. I'm trying to start from the, the beginning so we can start with that one and then go from there if we can we'll, we'll get as get to as many as we can all right and the first question we got um i have severe digestive disorders how do i connect it to my military service <clears throat> from mike mike dancy uh mike it's going to be one of those things uh did you go see this from your doctor when you're in service and all those things and do you have a service treatment record uh, from that time period. Um, so if you did, then it should be in your service treatment records. If you don't have access to that stuff, of course, get with your coach. Uh, if you don't have a coach yet, again, get on that discovery call and get on board. Um, one of those guys and gals will be able to get you started. But the key part of service connection um, is medical evidence. So getting that diagnosis for those conditions is very key. Getting that current diagnosis is very key. But a lot of part of this as well, and if you are a current client, then you know, getting with your coach and, and establishing, figuring out what's the best possible route to get those, get those records. And I think someone asked, how do we sign up? That was from Jamie Anderson. So um, you can, can sign up on VA Claimed Insider <laughs> slash Elite hyphen membership, um, or you can just uh, give us a call for the, um, the discovery call and they'll be able to kind of work you through the process there. Um, so let's see. So we've had a few listed here. So S. Hobson, I have GERD due to IBS 800s over the last 15 years. Is that a common nexus for GERD? So I think that we were able to answer this and I think I maybe alluded to answering it earlier, but um, it's definitely something that can potentially be connected. Um, you would likely need a nexus, which is what we were saying. Um, that long use of medication uh, over a course of, course of 15 years is definitely possible. But the biggest thing that I found with a lot of my vets is that needs to, you need to have proof that you've actually taken that medication over those years. All right, Chris Giles, um, I have a total of 60% disability with 50% PTSD. I'd like to add sleep apnea as a secondary claim for PTSD, but the company I'm working with here said I shouldn't because he thinks that the VA would lower my PTSD percentage um, because I don't look like I have PTSD. 
see that that kind of takes us into a realm where I don't know if we're allowed to go too deep into that, but it would be best if you could sign up and get get assigned with a coach. Um, what I can say um, generically is that uh, sleep apnea is one of the most difficult claims to get service connected. Uh, putting it secondary to mental health is not really a common one in general. Uh, it, we've seen it work in the past, but it's going to go better secondary to upper respiratory conditions. So um, if you're able to speak with a coach, get signed up, they might be able to look into your files and see if there's anything else that we can get you connected for. Say if you were exposed to burn pits or something, or there's anything in your records um, where we can potentially, you know, talk to you about what other conditions it can go secondary to, but uh, putting it secondary to PTSD is a little bit more difficult, um, more of a stretch than if you were to do it secondary to something that's upper respiratory. Yeah, again, being very generic, it can be connected to one of these, uh, to GERD as well, you know, that that blockage of the, of the soft palate is, is the key part of that too. But again, it's got to be nexus. you got to have service connection for it. Um, diagnosis, all those pieces are all part of this too. You know, mm -hmm. um, coach Natalie alluded to the, the whole Kaluza triangle that is very key to this process too, but really getting with your coach and getting on board and getting that strategy going is going to be the big part of it too. So yeah. we got another one here too. Simone Hamilton, my knee pain was thoroughly documented within the medical records and they denied I had plenty of documentation, also got 20% for uh, a topical dermatitis. Can I think that's a rosacea and an eczema be secondary? Sorry, I can't pronounce both of those. <laughs> I'm not great with those. Um, a lot of things can be, can be considered secondary, but again, having that diagnosis and getting the nexus to, to prove those things is very, very key. Um, speaking in again, in generic terms, this is not exactly uh, the idea of that form is like what uh, coach Natalie had alluded to as well, is that um, it says you have plain documentation. Okay. The, the documentation alone itself, uh, service trait records and all those other things, they're, they're great pieces, but, the key to this part, and again, getting signed up, getting with your coach, or getting with a coach here at VA Claims Insider is going to be a big part of your of your strategy and talking about what's the best possible route. Is this the least path of resistance? Um, does she have enough information in her records to prove nexus, to prove that link to service? Um, just having documentation, um, if it is from your service treatment records, that could prove nexus. But again. Um, speaking in general terms, and it, it could. Yeah, um, like we, we're probably going to say this a bunch of times today, but that the Kaluza triangle is key. So in your decision letter, you'll likely see that there's one of those three that's missing. It might say that they couldn't establish a connection, right? That's nexus. Or they might say that you don't have a current diagnosis. That means that you do have to have a current diagnosis here and now. So maybe you have the records from service that show that you had an ankle injury, but there was no continuity of care. Um, there was, you know, you've been out of the service for 10 years and there shows that there's, you know, you haven't gone to the doctor very frequently. Um, I know that this happened with me a, a bit um, for some of my conditions. I just kind of figured, well, if there's no cure for it, why am I going to go to the doctor? I'll just continue doing what I'm doing over the, you know, over the counter. And so I hear that a lot from a lot of my vets. And so it's a common thing, but you do have to go to the doctor and have a more current diagnosis. Um, and typically what I would say is if you can get something just written in your records within a year of time that we're going to be filing the claim, um, that's, uh, well, that you're going to be filing the claim. I want to be clear, <laughs> clear there. Um, that's going to help you out a lot more. You just want to make sure you have a current diagnosis that shows that the condition is still there despite having all the medical evidence. I know it seems a little wild that you have to meet all three of these criteria, but a lot of the times when you sign up with us, um, we're able to decipher those decision letters and um, figure out, you know, what exactly is the issue here and what is it that the VA is missing, especially if it's something so clear cut. Yeah, those, those decision letters are literally our roadmap for us to kind of look at and see what's the least path of resistance. Did they miss something? Did we miss something? 
or are we missing something in, in general? Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe you came on board with us and you, you didn't have uh, that nexus. Most, com- most common uh, occurrence for a denial is the missing nexus, the link to service. So that's, that's very, very, very true in most cases. Uh, Natalie, did you answer S. Hobson's, the ibuprofen one, or is that one new? Yeah. We, we touched on that one. Okay. Um, I have Willie Beatty. Um, so my local VA rep told me that because I did not become disabled while on active duty, I'm not eligible for VA disability. Is this accurate? Absolutely not. Um, if you served, you absolutely deserve. There's always, I, I believe if there's a will, then there's a way, right? Um, the, the key thing, right, uh, if you're trying to connect something primary as a primary condition, then it does help one if there is evidence within your service records. If there isn't evidence and you didn't make any complaints, like many of us that didn't, um, because the military has kind of pushed us to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with me, I have to keep going. Um, that doesn't necessarily push you out of the, you know, out of the line to be able to get service connected. There are presumptives depending on where you've been, where you've been sent to and deployed. Um, You know, there's a foot in the door with tinnitus, depending on like whatever your, uh, your MOS was, because that's really subjective, right? And once we can get your foot in the door, there's, you know, endless possibilities of where we can go from there. So um, no, that is not accurate. I'm so sorry that someone told you that, but uh, you should probably try and get signed up with us. We'd be able to help you out. Figure out something. Um, that's kind of what we, what we do is, uh, you know, we come up with a strategy and we're really, we're really pulling apart, you know, some of the hard, the hard pieces of claims, you know, where it seems like it's been years and it's hard for you guys, you know, 10, 20 years of waiting and fighting to get into these, into the VA system. Um, we're able to kind of pull those apart and, you know, figure out, okay, what have you tried already? And then what can we try now? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, at the very least, it doesn't hurt to get signed up and, you know, for us to take a look at your records and see what we can do for you. Um, Don Kammerer's got, got, or Don Kammerer's got one here too. Can sleep apnea be secondary to allergic rhinitis? So again, coach Natalie alluded to that one as well. We're talking about upper respiratory conditions, possibly GERD can be, can be considered a secondary for, for sleep apnea. Um, but that nexus is going to be very key. All the, the different pieces to the puzzle are all going to be very key. You need that current diagnosis of sleep apnea, uh, of both of those conditions. Those are presumptive conditions. So if you were in those areas, those, those could be covered underneath that as well. Um, there's a lot of pieces in there, but again, getting with a coach, here at VA Claims Insider is going to be a very big part of that too, where you can kind of build that strategy to figure out what's the least path of resistance, what's the best best path for, for Don to be able to go after this specific uh, condition. Um, the one thing we always uh, tell everyone too is this is the most deniable claim. Um, not impossible claim, I'm service connected for for 50%, but it is is the most deniable claim in the VA. Yeah. And the key word there, not impossible, all right? It is not impossible. If you want to go for it, we're, we're always going to try and push to, to gather the right evidence, um, you know, strategy, education, and the medical evidence um, to help you get where you got to go. But sometimes, you know, we'll also say, hey, it might be better to go this route instead, um, and just to kind of get you that percentage that you deserve, uh, whereas sometimes it's more important to go for the percentage that you deserve versus the specific condition that you're really adamant on getting. Let's see. Let's see. So Tonio Espinoza says, I submitted DBQs from Telemedica increase for migraines and GERD. Will I get a CMP exam or will the VA rate me based on the filled out DBQ? Um, Very good question. Uh, It really just kind of depends on who is in charge over at the VA. Um, We have no control over that. But um, in most cases, CMP exams will still likely happen. I I think I'm seeing like 85, 90 percent of them still pushing out CMP exams. Sometimes they will do something that is called an ACE exam, which is acceptable clinical evidence. If they feel like that DBQ has, has met all of the questions that they may actually have for you. Um, a lot of the times it does still kind of 
push past needing the CMP and they're able to make a decision off of that. It's really just kind of a waiting game and seeing what they've decided for you and you'll receive a letter either in the mail or notification on your, um, on your profile. All right, let's see, because there was a few from the beginning. Let's see, so Patrick Johnson, can we tie GERD and IBS by uh, diverticulitis and uh, colon cramps? I'm down two to three times a month for these illnesses. Um, so I believe that GERD and IBS are, uh, you can't get rated for both. Um, but you can get rated for the higher, the higher value. So um, say that your condition is uh, becoming more intense, whether it's with GERD or IBS, uh, at some point they will not give you a separate rating and they'll just give you the higher rating depending on the severity of your symptoms. Diverticulitis is its own separate condition that is service connectable. Um, and colon cramps, I don't really think that's an actual diagnosis. So... <laughs> Um, it's a symptom, but uh, the diverticulitis is a diagnosis, and that is something that can potentially be service connected. Um, and I do believe that they could all be tied together, but you would likely need an excess for that. And I think yeah, that colon cramps are it, underneath the bowel discomfort criteria, underneath the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I think that also answers uh, David Guevara's um, question can IBS and GERD be connected? Absolutely. One or the other, or um, one or the other, <laughs> literally. Uh, Got both, then they'll just, they'll combine them into one is, I guess, where I was trying to go. Right. With. And then Negro Damas, uh, where I can find the full list of presumptive conditions. Great question. Uh, if you search on vaclaimsinsider.com, for a full list and there's a link right there from VA Claims Insider for a VA presumptive list uh, currently what we have right now from directly from the VA. We try, we try to stay current as much as possible. Uh, we've got a lot of people here that have worked for the VA in some capacity and dive deep into these resources. So we try to keep them as current as possible, latest and greatest. Great question. That have worked for the VA in the past. I... Yes. Absolutely. I know that's what you said, but I just want to make sure that everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Had doesn't currently work. All right. Major 33 asks the question about uh, you started having bowel issues uh, and migraines um, since taking sertraline uh, for the PTSD. So that's uh, exactly what we spoke about earlier. So um, you told your psychiatrist and they documented it, discontinued sertraline. Can you file IBS slash migraines? Absolutely. You will likely need a nexus. You can put that secondary um, to the PTSD, which is what we were talking about earlier. Um, so absolutely. Uh, I would just definitely give that a shot. Um, one of the things that I personally had to do with the VA when it came down to like taking medications and really building that evidence um, and I'm not suggesting that anyone else do this here, uh, but when something didn't work, I would make sure that I mentioned it to my primary care provider, to my psychiatrist, my therapist, whoever. Um, and I actually ended up going through a list of those, those medications um, to build up the evidence that, hey, whatever you guys are giving me isn't working. Um, but again, the, the piece that I want you guys to take from this is if it's not working, you want to definitely, absolutely never forget, minimize or anything, just get it recorded um, each time. Um, that's building the evidence to show that it's more severe without you actually just having to come out of your mouth and saying it's more severe. Um, it's actually just showing through what the doctors are doing and their mitigating steps, or at least what they're trying to do, that it's, you know, it's more than than just, you know, the basic level of whatever they've rated you for in the past or the fact that they likely won't rate you right away. Um, it's, it's building that evidence to show that you should be rated. I had to do that for my migraines and I had to do that for my mental health. Yeah. And then just, just part of that too, if, if you can't get a hold of your, your primary care, use that secure messaging portal, go on to my healthy vet and use that secure messaging portal complain about those symptoms, 
whatever it happens to be, really speaking to the symptoms, not the diagnosis. Again, we're not doctors here. So just really speak to your symptoms mm -hmm. and don't self-diagnose yourself. That's, that's the bigger piece of this too. You probably hear that from your coach too. Um, not self-diagnosing yourself and speaking to those symptoms uh, helps you in this process too, because that will um, get that bill to get that doctor's attention. It's like, Hey, see, he or she's having this problem. This is going on. And they may see you for those things. And that's evidence that shows up in your records too. So you can use it as, as probative value in your evidence with your continuity of care. Wow. Yeah. And that's actually a really good point. Um, let's touch on that just a little bit more because it sounds like, you know, when we say this, you know, you have easy access to the, to the VA system if you're using the VA, right? So you have access to secure messaging on my healthy vet. Um, you still have, you might have that access. I would reach out if you're, if you're in your, uh, if you're using private healthcare, sometimes they also have similar platforms where you can message them. But like Ian was saying, it's literally building that evidence that's required each time that you have a flare up. We all know that it might take a month or two when you call the call in and say, Hey, I'm dealing with this for them to actually get you set into an appointment. But if you're having flare ups two times a week, three times a week, um, you, you know, your headaches are flaring up, your IBS, your GERD is flaring up. Um, you can just send them a message each time you have a really bad day. Today, I was unable to even eat a single thing, right? Or um, today, my migraines were this bad. I had to stay out of work for 48 hours. Um, what do you want me to do about it, doc? You know, um, when can you get me in for an appointment? And then if it happens the next week, hey, I didn't really get any information from you last week on this, but today was another bad day, right? So you're building that evidence each time, um, which you can do more frequently, obviously, than setting up one appointment that's going to come maybe like three or four weeks later and then talk about what's happened over the over the month. This is actually building it up in real time. Good point, Ian. Let's see. Can I get through these start comments here? Okay, so let's see. We have Andy Lopez um, filed for GERD secondary to PTSD due to side effects of medication with the Nexus letter, as well as actionable um, and sufficient DBQ. The VA scheduled an ACE exam. Is this normal? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. We were just talking about that. It's uh, it's possible that if they feel like they've had enough information, you've submitted enough information for them, they'll say it's acceptable clinical evidence, which is what ACE exam stands for. Um, and they will make a decision based off of the other doctor's notes that you've submitted to them. So absolutely. Um, we're running out of time. So we're Bob, down to two minutes, probably enough time for one, maybe two, if we can get two smaller ones to so Bob Rinninger, um, when you call to learn more and sign up, um, can you request a specific coach? I believe you can. Um, we have our own links here, uh, but uh, there, I believe you can request a specific coach or once you get in with a coach, if they've just kind of assigned you, you can always ask that coach to, to move to someone specific that you know of. That was a small one, Ian. <laughs> it was. And Talisha Rosin Kellogg, can you please answer a question? She says, can diabetes be secondary to kidney stones? That's going to be very specific, again, um, getting with your coach and, and really establishing the, that. Of course, if there's, if there's a link to the two conditions and you and your coach figure out that there is a link between those two conditions, um, I myself don't know the new uh, link to those conditions, but if there is a link to those conditions, you guys find nexus between those two conditions, then it, there, there's a possibility there. Um, but again, that's in vague terms. It, it, if there is a link there and, and it has to be proven, recent diagnosis, current diagnosis with the nexus and all those things in that with probative value. I would take it even a step further um, to say like not even so much for your coach to establish if that if that makes sense. What we would likely have you do is send you over to Telemedica, um, you know, our partnered company uh, of doctors, and they would be able to assess it because that's more in their wheelhouse. If it's something that, you know, has, you know, probative evidence from the past, you know, of other people dealing with that condition, they'd be able to better tell um, if that makes sense to make that connection or not. And um, also a really cool thing about Telemedica, I'm just going to plug this in here really quick. They... <laughs> 
they have started doing these comprehensive reviews. And so um, if you submit as much of your documentation as you have, they'd be able to actually take a look and, uh, and list out all of the conditions that um, you are struggling with and that they may be able to write a nexus for. So that would be the best first place to start with that. Um, with something like that or a question like that. And I'll, I'll do one more. So Michelle McCraney, where do I even start to get the migraines percentage raised by building your evidence? So if you're already service connected, you don't need a nexus. Um, you are just going to build your evidence on that severity, frequency, and duration. How bad is it? How long does it last? And how often does it happen for you? Um, that's really the biggest piece of getting that started, talking with your doctors and getting that evidence in there. You can also go to through Telemedica services. Um, if you sign up with us today, and uh, it doesn't have to be today, by the way, I'm not <laughs> that pushy of a person, but um, if, you, if you were to sign up, you can also get a, a DBQ or disability benefits questionnaire completed based off of that. So you're, you're in a good place if you're already service connected. There's right. some resources out there, too, that you can utilize for logging your migraines and stuff like that, too, that you can get with your coach about um, a lot of different different resources in that sense, too. But yeah, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, thanks for bearing with us about talking about high value claims uh, with IBS migraines and GERD, uh, service connected with uh, PTSD and, well, mental health in general. Um, again, building that strategy, education and medical evidence. That's a big intricate part, also known as our SEM method. You know, the strategy, what you build with your, with your coach as far as your roadmap, the education that we provide both on VAClaimsInsider.com and on the Insider Portal, which is where you'll have access to once you become an elite member. And then the one-on-one -on -one coaching you'll have with one of us uh, as your coach through this entire process, through this journey. Um, <clears throat> of course, you're going to do claims submission on your own with your coach. Uh, we can't do it for you. We can't do any of those things for you. Uh, CEP preparation, an intricate part of this too. Um, going to those live classes, talking about, um, or going to those live classes to hear what, what the other coaches have to say. I always say go to one or two or at least, at least one other besides the one that we prep for. <clears throat> we have live classes via zoom three times a day one of my favorite ones is coffee with coaches it's kind of my multiple mondays my wake-up call to be able to get my day going uh, but of course attend early and often uh, the mental health class the medical prep class uh, the new client orientation class if you're you, if you do become a new client uh, those are both on tuesdays and thursdays mental health is on mondays and thursdays and then medical prep is on monday and tuesday again Check out Brian's new book, You Deserve It, second edition. It is out now. You can check it out. You should be able to find it on Amazon.com. Um, book that free discovery call. If you want to learn more, schedule a free discovery call and call and talk to one of our team members or go by going to VA Claims Insider or VA Claims.com. Or I'm sure who wants this. So, VA so if you need help, yeah, dot help. I don't know how I did get that in. So if you need help, please reach out to the organization via claimsandcenter.com. We'd love to partner up with you here on your VA claim journey. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this with us. Natalie, it's always a pleasure to be with my sister here on these Facebook Lives. I'd love to do another one. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.